Welcome everyone to the Gamer Professor's Take, and today we are talking about Nintendo's formal apology concerning their Joy-Con drift and the class action lawsuit that is following them. But let's go ahead, let's get into it. And you'll see the screenshots up above me here from the article, uh, IGN quoting Kotaku. So let's start. Nintendo has made a formal apology for Joy-Con drift issues frequently experienced with the Nintendo Switch's controllers, although is unable to provide further comment due to the problem being the subject of a current class action lawsuit. Again, we'll get back to that. The apology was made during Nintendo's latest financial Q&A. Quote, regarding the Joy-Con, we apologize for any trouble caused to our customers, said Shuntaro Furukawa, the company's president. As reported by Kotaku, quote, we are continuing to aim to improve our products, but as the Joy-Con is the subject of a class action lawsuit in the United States, and this is still a pending issue, we would like to refrain from responding about any specific actions. The article continues, Joy-Con drift has been an issue hounding Nintendo Switch users for three years and continuing. Yes, and I'll explain that personally. Since the console launched, many players have found that their analog sticks drift, meaning movement can be seen on screen even when you are not touching the sticks at all. Last year, Nintendo began to offer Joy-Con repairs for free and refunded those who had paid in previous years, but regardless, it is still a huge issue in 2020. Yes, it is. Finally, last year, U.S. law firm Chemikles schwartz I love these attorney names, and Donaldson Smith filed a class action lawsuit against Nintendo, stating that Joy-Cons violate, quote, various consumer protection statutes as well as various warranty and common law claims. It is angled against not just the standard Joy-Cons, but the analog sticks on the Switch Lite, too. So first off, let's start here. I own two Nintendo Switches. Here, here's one of them right here, okay? And I got the Joy-Con detached. I know someone's going to be like, hey, why does he only have one Joy-Con? I got, I got it detached for another reason. I'll tell you in a second. But I have two of them. Have the Joy-Cons and the Joy-Con drift been an issue? Yes. It's been such an issue that I actually now buy the Joy-Cons in bulk. I'm not kidding. I don't buy a, a one or two pack. I buy an eight pack because I know I'm going to go through them. I've probably gone through with two Nintendo Switches so far and had to replace, I want to say, you know, eight to ten. And I, you know, I would buy two and then I'd buy two and then I'd buy two. And then I was like, okay, forget this. Like these things are breaking every like couple of months. But let's look at why they are breaking. Let's, let's look at that. Why is this a problem? And I think that it really boils down to one thing. And that is the argument between form and function. And in case, you know, I don't always assume this, that people know what I'm talking about. So the best way to explain this is the car analogy. And here you'll see a picture of the Bugatti Veyron. Now, if you don't know about the Bugatti Veyron, uh, when it was released, it had a thousand horsepower, um, you know, four turbochargers, and it had then the Super Sport version. And, but the, the key of the Veyron was that it was supposed to go really fast, 250 miles an hour, 260 miles an hour, right? But that is function, not form. When the Veyron first came out, a lot of enthusiasts, a lot of car people said, that is an ugly car. Now, I've seen one in real life, and it has that supercar effect where, you know, it's really low, super wide, but it's not a super pretty car. It's not hideous. It's just not the most pretty car out there. I, you know, Ferrari 458, 488, the Lamborghini, you know, Aventador, Huracan, like, I think those are pretty. The Bugatti is not. Why? Well, simp simply stated, it's because they went for function over the form. Instead of pondering how it looks, they realized that looks didn't matter. It mattered if it could function correctly. And especially at those sort of speeds. You know, a lot of people don't understand that when, you know, the leap from 150 miles an hour to 200 miles an hour in a car is quite the leap. And I remember, uh, I believe it was Bugatti's main test driver and also their 
chief engineer had, had said that like a lot of people don't realize that the difference between 200 miles an hour and like 220 was a massive gap, not to mention 220 to 240. And then at that point, every like five miles an hour you try and put on top of that is a completely different ball game. The amount of stress the tires are going through, the amount of air needed for that engine to keep increasing, like all of these things. So the Bugatti Veyron, when it was made, was not made to be this absolutely beautiful, gorgeous thing. It was made to go super fast. Therefore, the car needed to function as such to go super fast. And that's why it looks the way it does. That's why it has those large roof scoops, right? All of these things done for the function of it. Now let's get to the Nintendo Switch and how does this relate to the Nintendo Switch? Form versus function. Well, it's pretty simple. Again, back to the Nintendo Switch. Do you see how thin this is? Now, if you can't see, I'm going to put my finger up to it right here. You can see that's that's not very wide. To give you an actual um, representation, the, the actual size of it, just to give you an idea, is less than a penny, the thickness. It's less, technically, than a dime. That's how small this thing is. So what happened? Why do you think that the Joy-Cons have an issue? Let me be clear. I don't know how long I've had, you know, my Xbox controller. Sorry, the pop filter's getting out of whack here. Keeps wanting to move over to the side. There we go. I don't know how many times, you know, I've gone through controllers as it relates to an Xbox or a PlayStation, but never have I had an issue with the drift. But there's something very interesting here. Here is the Joy-Con. Now, again, you can see this is not massively large, right? There's my, there's my finger here. Here is the actual housing for this Joy-Con. Look how thin that is. Here by comparison, is the housing to an Xbox One controller. The problem, I think, if I had to put it on one thing, is that Nintendo went for form over function. The whole point of the Nintendo Switch is to be a very small console that has a lot of portability, that ability to take it where you want. So they can't have massive, massive controllers and they can't have the system be super thick and weigh seven pounds, right? It's got to be portable. So they've got to do something about that. And, you know, I've done, I don't, you know, again, I probably more than 10 now that I really think about it, surgeries on the, and I call it surgery, surgeries on these uh, joy cons where I've had to take them apart and the housing if you ever see it the housing for the actual controller is like that thin so really even though it's it's beautiful in the form of hey it's really small and it's not you know this massive chunky piece of equipment the functionality is problematic because it I mean to go back to the dime reference you've got I'd say the housing for the controller is like the a fifth Maybe, you know, a quarter of the size, a quarter, I should say, a fourth of the size of a dime. It's super small. So it's it's highly problematic. And that's why I think so many of the Joy-Cons have broken. They've had these drift issues. Because when you're, you know, let's say you're playing Dark Souls Remastered on your Switch or something. And, you know, you, you're trying to move and freak out. And your thumb is pressing into that housing there's just not a lot of leeway or structural support for the housing itself. And so I'm not even surprised that it gets broke, that it gets stuck, that it gets, you know, pressed. Because it's, there's just not, I, I hate to say it like this, but there's just not enough room to breathe in there. It needs more space to have a more firm structure at the base of the Joy-Con, especially the, you know, the, the analog stick. I don't know how else to say it. And that would be my number one guess, especially after taking them apart so many times and seeing just how small those housings were. And that's why if we go back to round out this video, if we go back to the final element where it says that the class action lawsuit is that the Joy-Cons, quote, various, they violate various consumer protection statutes as well as various 
warranty and common law claims. See, there's two aspects to that. Number one, if you make something that you know is a company and you know is going to break, and then people have to keep buying the products because you didn't make them well enough, that's a problem, right? You can't do that, right? Secondly, the warranty issues, like how you know problematic is it to have to not only send your thing away to get repaired, but then wait and then you don't have access to it, all of these things. So I am interested to see where this goes as it relates to Nintendo. And if again, if I had to pin it on one thing, it would be the fact that Nintendo went with the form rather than the function. They said, we need to make it small. We need to make it portable. Yeah, you know, maybe the housing isn't as sturdy or as thick as we need it, but we can't have a massive, massive console here, right? That, you know, is super heavy, even though it may be more durable. And that's the reality of it. The thinner you get with anything, especially an electronic, again, not all of them, but especially with electronics, the less ability you have to make it you know, more durable. And I think that's really where Nintendo kind of landed in hot water here. And I am a victim of dealing with Joy-Con drift. Um, so I understand that this is a problem. You know, I, I'm not going to join the class action lawsuit, but it has told me that this is a problem. And it's not that I think that Nintendo makes terrible equipment. I mean, you know, the Super Nintendo was awesome. That thing always worked. Uh, you know, but I mean, think about the original Nintendo, right? How many times did you have to blow on the uh, the cartridge to get it to work, even though I don't know if that actually was the reason. But this is a problem, and I think the next time Nintendo makes a reiteration of the Switch, they will absolutely change either the housing or how it's built. I think they're going to have to do that because the form is good, but the function itself, well, that leaves a lot to be desired. Thank you for watching The Gamer Professor. If you enjoyed what you saw, please subscribe. And remember, you can always catch me on all my other social platforms, such as Twitch, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. All one name, The Gamer Professor. Thank you so much, and I appreciate the view.